Yes. Can we aspire to have an ideal system of education? In your view, what should it look like? It's very difficult to talk about ideal situation, but even then, I mean, in the light of uh, uh, teaching learning science, one can think of um, a system of education which will facilitate effective learning. And, and that can be called ideal. But at the same time, you know, what we really understand from philosophy of education is that each socio-economic system had its own parameters of education and its own methods of instruction and so on. And each socio-economic system required uh, certain attributes from the educated. With the result, they planned the education accordingly and, and naturally uh, what they considered important for the system, I mean the socio-economic system, uh, uh, were ideal. And uh, any education which would be providing uh, these goals would be ideal for them. But if we think in terms of um, a, a, you know, a critical understanding, which will certainly relate to our contemporary consciousness and uh, we would be taking into account what the existing socio-economic system uh, from a point of view of ethical postulates would require and an education which would satisfy that um, must be critically oriented that education must be generating critical consciousness Naturally, we would identify that as the ideal system of education. What is your diagnosis of the current system of education in India? Uh, current system, uh, everybody says that it's very poor, it's very bad. And uh, that belief is so entrenched that nobody would like to question it. So it is generally accepted that the system is very bad. We have to replace it in one way or other. What is the dominant economy right now and what is its influence? Yeah, dominant economy is capitalism anyway, but the advanced the phase of capitalism is called techno-capitalism. Techno-capitalism um, focuses on science and technology as its major resources. And uh, unlike the previous phases of capitalism, techno-capitalism is focusing on intellectual productions. Uh, we, we, we can identify uh, them as intangible assets. The creativity or innovativeness of a scientist or a technologist uh, is considered to be most important for it. And, uh, it is now conducting business around transactions of what is called intellectual products. And not only products, rights relating to products, intellectual property rights, patents and so on. The economy is transacting knowledge on the basis of the intellectual property rights and rights of patents. Uh, it is estimated that something like four-fifths of the total uh, turnover uh, belong to the intellectual regime. It's intellectual property which has become extremely important for techno-capitalism. It's also identified as one of the most uh, effective ways of facilitating better accumulation. On what plane are the differences with the current state of affairs? Lack of government spending or the overall policy paradigm? Uh, the policy at the government level would mean only a representation of the dominant economy's interests. Naturally, policy would be uh, decided accordingly, but it would always constitute a rhetoric of its own. That's People should think that it is their agenda which is taken up seriously. With the result, normally there would be a rhetoric part of it which would talk about 
the limitations of education. Um, in in va various ways, the rhetoric would talk about privatization, commercialization, and so on. But the actual agenda is facilitation of commercialization, privatization, and so on. Uh, ever since uh, 2005, we have been considering education sector as basically a profit-oriented private sector. State would also participate in that, but largely it is conceived as a private sector for profit accumulation. Uh, but you know this is seriously contested and therefore you find every time a rhetoric is put up. That is to justify the public needs and so on. And, and many things are hidden behind the single word development. But a actual interest is to privatize education. And uh, that has been the uh, responsibility or what you call international obligation ever since the signing of God's agreement in 2005. Have the economic reforms of 1991 affected the educational policies and intellectual property rights? Yes, regime? 1991 we consider as the landmark of new economic reforms, liberalization, structural adjustment and, and so on. And this is what I indicated earlier as part of privatization and commercialization. The World Trade Organization wanted to capture the, the domain of education, uh, obviously very profitable and uh, also involving an unusually vast clientele. So they thought that they would make very good business in the developing countries uh, with uh, the, uh, the level of literacy being uh, steadily rising. Uh, but at the same time having a lot of potential for maximization. So they calculated something like three trillion dollar affair uh, in the education sector. Th that was the major attraction for World Trade Organization um, in capturing the education sector, especially the education sector of the developing countries. Uh, India was assiduously persuaded to fall in line uh, in spite of the Doha round of the, the conference which allowed the participants to put up some of their stakes and claims and so on. Uh, India had to agree summarily with the provisions enunciated I and mean, provisions stipulated by uh, the guards. So the general agreement um, of tariff and services uh, persuaded India to allow education as a, a, an object uh, of private interest and uh, state was uh, given the option whether state should be a leading player in it or not. But uh, always having the imposition of various other capitalist responsibilities requiring allocation of revenue. Uh, the state had no other way. The state started uh, speaking about the inability of the state in supporting education. Uh, even primary level education, which uh, the constitution stipulates as something mandatory for the state. But uh, the state was talking about uh, universalization of education as a joint enterprise. The, the state as well as the private sector uh, should join. <coughs> and then uh, somehow the state uh, still believed uh, apparently that education should be primarily the agenda of the state. But higher education anyway uh, was considered to be a matter of uh, not only joint enterprise, but an enterprise predominantly run by the private sector. So that was the, the main uh, interest. And it was uh, stated in the document that the country would be able to make profit 
to education. Now, actual uh, thing is that the developed countries would be able to make profit and not the developing country as such. So this has been the major development after 1991 and it has been steadily going on. But uh, some of the uh, responsibilities have not been met. I mean the uh, obligations. Obligations as per the guards agreement. Um, one is the total privatization of the higher education sector. But it tried to initiate through a series of bills. Um, but except in the Private Universities Act, uh, Private Universities Bill, which got enacted and became uh, a bill, I mean, uh, became an act. Uh, other uh, proposed bills are still pending legislation. Uh, due to uh, widespread criticism, this was not being materialized. But private universities have come up, but University Grants Commission as the regulatory body, I mean, regulatory institution, uh, was not allowing free play of the private universities. Uh, it went on insisting certain uh, conditions which would satisfy quality and so on. Uh, but now the effort is to overcome even that. Now how to scrap UGC altogether and then overcome the statutory impediments. So it's uh, intended to be uh, a sector of freewheeling privatization as far as the, the state is concerned now. I mean, and, and this is the direction to which the reforms of 1991 are taking the country. What is the overall effect of this techno-capitalism on education and thereby on the people? Yeah, on the people certainly it's a very <coughs> dangerous kind of uh, 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 process. It's certainly going to have deleterious impact on the people. Uh, but the immediate uh, thing is, even the people involved in education, higher education, the most creative among them, uh, are going to be subjected to a ruthless confiscation of their creativity. Their innovativeness is uh, being confiscated for which we, we have the internationally accepted uh, covenants, rules, conventions and so on relating to intellectual property rights and patents. So the Im immediate problem would be the problem of converting the youth into uh, an apathetic situation, into a, a state where they are least perturbed by the the social reality, otherwise um, disturbing social reality. Then they, they are going to be converted into mechanical specialists with no perspective of holistic understanding. Uh, they are going to be converted into uh, robots. The whole intel intelligent youth would get converted into robots uh, who would act as disciplined entities, extremely disciplined entities, uh, satisfying the assigned purpose. It, it would be almost like the function of a, a machine in a huge mechanical system, just as a part of the whole is functioning, every individual will be functioning uh, um, in order to satisfy the required demand. But the only uh, only uh, thing is that they would be paid well. But this payment is for very heavy responsibility. It would act as a very powerful uh, influence on them, would take away their freedom and would always generate tension in them. And that is going to be the major uh, result. If you take it in a, a general way. But at the individual level, now, the individual creativity will be uh, confiscated by the techno-capitalist corporations. Now, a, a techno-capitalism has the most powerful uh, 
mode of organizing itself which is the corporate mode and corporate mode is uh, precluding the possibility of any democratic process and uh, this preparation is going on in every developing country today uh, you can look at the way india is shifting from uh, the democratic process to a totally undemocratic kind of process in matters of educational management this country has been um, running educational sectors by ensuring quality through various regulatory bodies highly specialized regulatory bodies are something like 14 for science technology etc and for general education uh, uh, something like 250 uh, bureaus and specialized bodies and so on under the umbrella of UGC which would mean that for any specialization you have at least something like 10 to uh, 15 people sitting together and um, formulating the, the criteria for quality assurance but now the idea is to scrap UGC to scrap all these regulatory statutory bodies uh, and then bring everything under one authority national uh, higher education authority once the bill was put up and in 2014 uh, under heavy criticism this was withdrawn but uh, once again it is put up in a different way the same idea that is to scrap UGC and various other democratic bodies and bring everything under uh, half a dozen people you know, in the name of authority and you have various authorities of that kind uh, in, in plan this is clearly indicating uh, death of democracy death of democracy in unexpected sectors but once democracy withdraws uh, democracy uh, uh, retreats from such avenues and that would affect the the, the larger uh, structure of the government and, and, and so on so in the field of education uh, it is being put up by pointing out that politicization is creating a lot of problems politicization of the youth uh, is taking away their time for learning and uh, that is considered to be anti-intellectual uh, although they don't say anti-intellectual um, in the in the real sense they use the term intellectual in the context of academic so political processes are considered to be anti-academic processes and therefore uh, that was one main uh, problem uh, and another uh, there is the outmoded syllabus and um, uh, outmoded teaching all these are apparent allegations their interest is not exactly improving the mode of teaching or improving the mode of learning and, and so on but the uh, actual uh, problem that they have been focusing or they have been trying to constitute the problem first and then focusing is the lack of discipline in the campus lack of discipline in the higher education institutions the so total regimentation becomes possible only when students are not allowed to operate with sense of creativity flexibility choice and so on um, every educationist of enlightenment has been talking about freedom of choice, flexibility and so on in the domain of academic practices for making the youth creative. But what corporate house is requiring or what techno capitalism is requiring you know, is uh, a totally disciplined youth or youth so trained in a disciplined way that they are immediately amenable to the corporate kind of um, uh, disciplining or corporate kind of regimentation so what they expect is rigorous training of the disciplinary kind in the campus itself so that the the youth uh, become 
really productive and they would be amenable to uh, all sorts of disciplinary stipulations. There is a view that most of the middle class possess that <coughs> education is a path to employment. Do you agree with that? Yeah, education certainly um, should lead the youth to employment, there is no doubt about it. But uh, making of morally responsible citizen is also uh, a, you know, part of the agenda. Education is not just for making people employable. Education is um, also for constituting a good citizenry. Each individual with critical consciousness, altruism, fellow feeling, larger social responsibility, national responsibility and so on. All these are part of education. Now, the corporate uh, uh, system is emphasizing the employment part uh, uh, in order to in inadvertently set aside the other critical values of education. They, they, they would consider uh, the actual functional part as the most vital. Broadly, in your view, what needs to be changed in the field of education? Uh, we cannot uh, have a ready-made answer for that because uh, it, there is no possibility of a repairance approach to this. Uh, and also, it is really too ambitious to be talking about a total change, which we know uh, theoretically non-feasible, because it's not uh, people who decide what should be the type of education and so on. Um, all that one can do is act as a, a critical insider by developing courses, curriculum and so on in such a way that they render um, enough knowledge in the subject concerned, I mean, deeper knowledge which is inherently subversive and critical. Uh, so people develop critical consciousness and they would be able to participate in uh, public policy debates and so on. Now, whatever is the specialization the student uh, is able to see things around in the light of the specialized knowledge. Uh, that kind of education um, we cannot expect from above. The state is not going to introduce that kind of a system. Um, particularly um, under chronic capitalism. You know, we have with uh, no wrap up no mask capitalism in its full form, completely supported by the state. And in such a system, um, education will go like this uh, with more difficulties, impediments and so on. And all these limitations and drawbacks are going to be uh, used for making institutions more and more uh, disciplined. Uh, because uh, the techno-military setup of techno-capitalism requires that kind of disciplined subjects. So naturally there would be pressure on uh, democracy to be corporatocracy and um, a state to be completely yielding to the corporate interests. Uh, with the result uh, that there should be a state acting uh, in an authoritarian way to satisfy the interests of the corporate establishments. But this education is um, going to be a, a, an object of trade for the small capitalists in the country and all sorts of business people and they all would be welcomed in the field because there is this feeling created that education is really bad and state is not able to manage. So any business,
people, any business people, business body uh, can enter the field and, and they would make profit. Uh, but all would be in the name of making higher education innovative and creative and so on. But uh, techno capitalists do not want innovatives, um, innovators or you know, um, people of creativity and scientists of creativity, technologists of creativity uh, made available everywhere. Techno capitalists can bring them from any part of the world and they don't uh, require them in large number. And also they know that people who are really trained with certain uh, areas of specialization uh, and also having a certain high level laboratory skill, uh, workshop skill uh, could be recruited and used. And innovation is going to take place in their setting, in their huge um, experimentalist institutions um, as a joint enterprise uh, or as a collective product, wherein the intellectual property right would go to the, the corporate house and patent would be taken by the institution, the corporate house. With the result, um, it becomes very easy for the corporate establishment to confiscate creativity from uh, the people. So therefore, uh, the public utterances relating to uh, quality restoration or making education professional, making education world class and so on, these are all, uh, you know, stale expressions just as part of the rhetoric. Uh, we cannot say that uh, you know, uh, we will be able to intervene and make the system quite ideal or it is not possible under the existing conditions to make the educational system a very desirable one through people's interference. People cannot do that or I mean through democratic process it is not possible. But all that is possible would be uh, students themselves become politically aware and uh, understanding each one's specialization with the politics of them. With the result, they will be able to communicate intellectually uh, against one another and generate an intellectual atmosphere of creativity, freedom. Um, flexibility, choice and so on. That will certainly matter and, and that would enhance the quality of the campus, quality of academic freedom and also they would bring in some uh, kind of authority and authenticity in the case of the remarks, the opinions of the youth. So educated youth in prestigious campuses would constitute perhaps the uh, most creative segment uh, among the specialists and, and and then I think we would be able to comply with the stipulations in the constitution of India. For example, article 51, article 51 uh, subdivision H, if I remember correctly, talks about scientific temperament. It is this segment of critical youth which is going to uh, show what scientific temperament means. You know, that group will generate um, a good number of technologists with scientific temper, scientists with scientific temper. Now, now you have scientific communities all over the world, but if you take the statistical assessment of the situation, you would find the, the number of scientists with scientific temper is abysmally poor. Many students from IIC <coughs> graduate and take up jobs in industry as well as research in public and private sectors. What would you have uh, to say to them? 
Yeah, you know, it is the normal course. They gain good laboratory skills, good theoretical knowledge, and also good competency from this prestigious institution. And, and then they are employed outside of the country. Uh, they are employed in uh, high paying private establishments. As individuals, they certainly make benefit out of that. But certainly the nation suffers. If they go in large number outside of the country, uh, it is a drain, brain drain. And brain drain is um, hiking in a big way under techno-capitalism. Because techno-capitalism has the capability to take uh, people of creativity from any part of the world. And uh, uh, something interesting is that from the Indian subcontinent, a good number of youngsters are going out. One, the nation cannot afford keeping them with high payment. With the result, they go away. Individually, one cannot um, find fault with them, but uh, as a collective process, it should be an important issue for the nation. Nation should be able to retain them. Nation should be able to pay them well and retain them and use them for national development. But national development strategies get adversely affected by this flow of people um, to foreign countries and private establishments. Now, the predicament is that uh, a nationally conscious, critical citizen may find fault with this but cannot raise it as an issue under the aforementioned circumstances. Since the nation is not able to protect them or since the nation is not really interested in keeping them, uh, there is no point in blaming the individuals. But all that I would uh, you know, like to say is that if they themselves are made critically aware of the process, that although they would be paid well for the time being, that they would be thrown out as well. And by the time they would have, they would have been completely deprived of their creative contributions, they would be alienated. So if they are critically aware of these things and if they are capable of realizing the process of confiscation of their creativity under the techno-military setup, there will be uh, a, a different uh, a type of reaction. They themselves would decide that they would serve their country, their society, they would remain here uh, instead of seeking individual well-being. No, certainly if people are made critically aware, I think the youth uh, would prefer um, national well-being to individual well-being.